Thank you, everybody, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Alam. Okay. Thank you, Professor Alam, and uh, distinguished professors. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues uh, in the UK and colleagues outside the UK. Thank you so much. I think we are all diasporas. Am I right in saying that? Good. So, if I'm not communicating, I think my fellow diasporas will call me back. Uh, today, when Professor Alam asked me to come and give a keynote speech, it rattled me for like two weeks on what am I going to talk about and what is the best thing I can use to engage the audience. Then I started thinking about myself as a diaspora, where, where have I gone wrong or what am I doing in the UK? I decided to take a different perspective looking at um, what we call latest technology, particularly the idea of digital economy that a lot of the Western economics are pursuing at the moment. And I said, I'm going to explore this. Coming, instead of going too much technical, I'll come from social science perspective. So I'm talking about uh, diaspora potentials, a big data platform. What I'm talking about, I'm going to ask firstly critical questions for all diasporas, big data analytics, engagement and exploitation. That's what I'll be talking about. So there's no doubt diasporas has got huge potentials. If you look at all of us here, we've got huge potentials. There's no doubt about it. I'm always confident if you talk of diasporas. And in fact, I think we are supporting the Western economies too much. That's my, that's my view of it. I, for example, myself, I've been away from, I'm originally from Nigeria. And I've not even visited Nigeria for the past 15 years. And people would ask me, you go to California, you go to Toronto, you go to everywhere. What's happening to you? Why have you not gone to your you know, home country? What about your families and everything? And I said, well, I tried to give her all the excuses I could, but people would tell you it doesn't hold. Those excuses are just flimsy, and uh, you need to connect back home. So we have great potentials, but I've got some seven critical questions for all of us. And if you can answer all these questions you know, correctly, perhaps... I need to give you 100 pounds, whoever can answer it. Uh, let's all ask ourselves these questions. The first one is this. Do the government of your homeland know who you are and where you are? Who can answer that? Do you think the government of Sudan or, I mean, we have Sudanese, we have Nigerians. Who, which country do we have? Jamaican. Jamaican. Which country else? Egyptians. Okay, so that's just four. Which other country? So people from Egypt, Saudi Arabia. OK. Uh, I think the present uh, king of Saudi Arabia is King Abdullah, right? Sorry. King Salman. I'm really sorry. Uh, the people from Saudi Arabia, do you think uh, King Salman know where you are? No? Do you know who you are? Do you think King Salman know who you are? where you are, your expertise and everything. People from Sudan, do you think uh, the government know who you are and where you are at the moment? Only the security apparatus. Only the security apparatus. Yes. Okay. The Jamaicans, do you think your president know where you are and who you are? Generally, no. And what about the Nigerians? Do you think Buhari know where you are at the moment? He has no idea. So do you think your government knows your expertise? Some of you are medical doctors, you know, academics, professors. Do you think your government know your expertise? They don't value it. But do you even think they know at all? For example, if we're talking of medical doctors in the UK that are Jamaicans. Yeah, but they don't know who they are and where they are. Good. And when you try to impose yourself, what, do you, what is the you know, opposing force you get when you are trying to do that? What's the threat or what's the, you know, the... Yes. They think you're trying to take their job. Don't mind them. They lost interest. That's it. And uh, for example, some of us might think we want to go back home, but do you, think, do you know which sectors our expertise will be needed back home? 
You know that. So which sector do you think the expertise will be needed? Yeah, but do you, can, you, can you put that in a fine grain detail? No. They're not interested in And if you need to return to your homeland, what support do you think you need to quickly settle down? A lot. And where do you think you can get such information on how you can quickly get set to them? Thank you. And let me ask this question. Do you think you must go back home before you contribute your expertise? So you think you can stay here and contribute your expertise? How? Okay. And why have you not been doing that? You do do that. And it's been well received. Fantastic. That's from Jamaica. Who else? Yeah, I think it's key for you to talk to first of all, that I have from outside because of the internal conditions there. Okay. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, the technology is not that high for it to allow me to, to transfer that. Okay. Um, how can you connect other diasporas in other countries? So we have Sudanese here in the UK. How do you think you can connect Sudanese in, in the US? Yeah. Apart from family membership. Or Sudanese in Japan. There are Sudan in Japan. There are Sudanese in Japan. There are Sudanese in Malaysia. If not for Professor Alam bringing everybody here together, how do you think you can connect each other? And yeah, apart from these conferences, apart from family contact, do you think you know all the Sudanese living in Singapore? There is no existing mechanism that means that. Thank you. And uh, finally, do you need the government all the time to contribute, to make you contribute to your homeland? Do you think the government is all the time? No. So, if the government, what else do you think you need, apart from the government, to contribute to your homeland? We, we need institutions. Okay. Uh, and who will enable that institutions? Me and you. Okay. So, that's exactly the underlying philosophy of what I want to discuss today. Answering all these critical questions require an integrated platform. And that integrated platform is what I'm trying to, you know, we, we don't have one at the moment. But how can we start thinking to have one? You know, we talk all the time, the government needs to support us. But apart from the government, can we even ourselves start something? I remembered vividly in 2005, I was in North Carolina in Charlotte. And there and then, we were in a conference it was energy conference, and we realized that most of us from Africa dominated about 75% of the participants of that conference, and Middle East, because most of the oil is an energy conference. Most of the oil comes from Middle East and African countries. And I think after, apart from those of us from Africa, the next one are the people from uh, South Americans, people from Brazil and Argentina. Now, the key question then we asked ourselves that what are we doing back home? A lot of us... We were professors, you know, doctors, engineers overseas working with Shell, Chevron, and all this stuff. And we then asked ourselves, how are we doing? There and then, we decided, to co we decided to formulate a committee, Committee for Disasters in Africa, CDR, CDA. And I think it's about, it took, after so much effort, within seven months, the United Nations recognized us. And we started some few work back in Africa, particularly we started some in Congo, DRC Congo, and uh, the other Congo, uh, Republic of Congo. And if not, I think two of the, uh, the, the leaders of that particular committee, they died. And that was how that particular committee died in 2009, four years later. But we need to come together, whether the government supports us or not, if the commitment is there, and effort is there. The government will not have a choice than just to, you know, support us and recognize us. And that's what I think we need to do. But in achieving that, we need a particular platform. So, I'm talking about big data. Last week I said this, when I was talking about in the World Association of Sustainable Development Conference. What is big data? I'm referring to large data sets that normal software could not analyze. So you need huge, uh, sorry, what do you call it? Huge database of software tools to capture, store, and manage, and analyze. So I'm talking of large data set, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, petabyte, and exabyte. And I'm talking of unstructured data. So it's not just about rows and columns, about pictures, videos of people. Let me give you an example. There is nothing stopping if we have medical doctors, consultants here, 
who will perform surgical operation, one in type of special surgical operation, get that particular surgical operation video recorded. Get a particular platform where universities, medical universities in Nigeria, Sudan, Ghana, can watch that particular video of that particular special case, surgical case, for students back there to improve their knowledge of medicine. But the key thing is that we need a platform. Apart from that, we're talking of data-driven research, businesses and decisions, efficient decisions in our hospitals, in our schools, in our road and transportation, in even sourcing funds, what we call crowdsourcing. Right? We have a lot of charity organizations, we have a lot of donors in Western countries. Can we actually come together, connect with ourselves, make good representation to these donors, and efficiently and transparently use these donations for the development of our country? And we're talking of high skills, high T statisticians, and so many. So the key thing about big data is this, is five key issues. Firstly, we're talking of volume. If we can document, and I'll show some of the examples. People have started this. Google have started. Twitter have started. And I can tell you, in the next two to three years, they will start selling that to the government of our nation and taking billions of dollars from them. I need to go back. I'm sorry, Joseph. I can't, I can't, I'm not a static person, unfortunately. So, velocity. We're talking of huge data set, that is volume, and the velocity at which we need that to be at real time, such that if I change my job today, the government of Nigeria we know. If I change my location, before now, I was in Belfast in Northern Ireland. I was head of department there. And do even the Nigerian High Commission in London knows that I'm no more in Belfast and I'm now in Bristol? No. So we're talking of things at real time. Where government, private sectors back home, or even public institutions like our universities can know where I am, what I'm currently doing. Take note, there are so much risk associated with it, and I'll talk about it later on. Because you're talking of things like privacy. You're talking of things like security. People exploiting those data and using it for what we call negative reasons. We'll talk about that later on. But the other key thing is about variety. Huge amount of data, location data, your name, your profession, where you are, what type of expertise you could contribute, which sectors can you work effectively for. And we're talking of veracity. How authentic the data are? Who is going to verify this data? Such that if a business mogul in Nigeria or a business mogul in Saudi Arabia, one of the princes in Saudi Arabia, decides that he wants to build a petrochemical plant, right? In his country, where can he get the expertise? He will go to this database. How accurate is this database? What is the veracity of the data that you have? And how can we bring all these things together to achieve value? Take note. The key thing about all this social media, it has an underlying dimension. LinkedIn, Google, <coughs> Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's about crowdsourcing of data and bringing value, integrating everything together. The whole idea of Facebook is about connecting people together. That's the whole idea of Facebook. My f data, things about me, connecting it with others, that's all. The whole idea of LinkedIn, I said it that Microsoft just bought LinkedIn for $24 billion. Why do Microsoft want to do that? Why can't Microsoft, with all their technological know-how, why can't they just create a parallel structure for LinkedIn? Why did Facebook decide to buy WhatsApp for 15 billion US dollars? Why? Because it takes a while to create a network of people. If you do that, what if people do not use it? What if they don't talk to each other? But we have an opportunity as diasporans. There's one common thing. You're from Sudan, you're from Saudi Arabia, you're from Nigeria. There's one major thing that we have. And what is it? We are diasporas. And another major thing is we all have our potentials. If that's the case, how do we get value from that? I haven't got much time, so I need to move on fast. So I always say that big data is useless if you're not using big data analytics. You use analytics to drive value. 
Because about the process of examining large data sets to uncover hidden patterns, we are the doctors, we are the, cardiolog we are the cardiologists in the UK. How can I see the cardiologists in the entire Europe that are from Sudan? Because we have a big cardiac arrest issues all the time in Sudan. How can the government tap into that? It's the real game changer, that's what I call it. So what are the mutual opportunities? Let's look at this, because I haven't got time. At the moment, Twitter have started mapping expertise. Look at it. Expertise of diasporas, they've started. Twitter have started. And I can tell you in three years' time, Twitter will finish this project. And they will start going to all the governments that are non-Western and selling this data to them. Look, if you're looking for medical doctors in UK that are Saudi Arabia, that are Saudis, we know where they are. We know their expertise. Twitter will sell this to Saudi government. And Saudi government will buy the two billion dollars. They will not even pay money at one go. What these companies do, they call it data as a service. That's what Google does. You will pay annual subscription. Because why? That's how you get inflow of money. This is the economic model of UK and US at the moment. It's based on annual subscription. It's not a one-time payment. So they started that already. Let's move on. The key, three, the key thing is about a three-dimensional high CT. Where you have the worlds, where you, the worlds. Are you talking of medical world, construction world, whatever world you could talk about, the location, where you are. What is the nature of that particular job or expertise you are offering in that world? The behavior and the activity that you are doing. It's all about the infrastructure, which Google is trying to claim they will provide. Twitter is also doing it. IBM will start their own soon. Generic services and capacity and knowledge and skills will map all that together. There's going to be regulation, but if the African countries and we ourselves, we are not fast enough, the Western world will be faster than us. They will regulate it and we will have to pay for it. And what are the incentives? The incentives that they would exploit us to contribute back to our country. Can you imagine? I haven't got time. Another one, for example, is what you call NAMESO. Google have started this now. This is what Google have started. Names reflect cultural identity. NAMESO is the data mining software that can recognize linguistic cultural. So if you type Mahmoud, I want Mahmoud in the UK, it will bring all the Mahmoud that are available in the UK. This is a typical example. Honoma, how many Honoma do I have in the United Kingdom? My target is France, but I'm looking at all other sources that are available there. 16 of them. What is the waiting? 27 of them. And you have all this. These are just simple business intelligence that will come up in terms of you trying to get the name of people. I want David. How many David? David from Nigeria. How many of them that live in East London? And what is their expertise? This is what Google is trying to come up with at the moment. And even to the extent that they are trying to move and look at the flow of people, where people are moving into. Look at it. From United Arab Emirates going into United Kingdom, going into US. All this could be mapped easily. They combine flight data with Twitter data, with LinkedIn data, and they can produce huge amount of traffic flow, flow of movement of people, who is going where and when. Let's take, for example, cancer research. I want to know, I want to map talent in cancer research. Who are the people with expertise in cancer research? Which country? US, France. This is visual analytics. Who is in cancer research? We can easily do this when we are talking of, for example, I need cancer research. Who are the experts in cancer research in the entire Africa? Where are the experts of cancer research? Let's move on because I haven't got time. How many minutes have I got? Five minutes. I'll finish. Let's take, for example, cancer research. This is Polish and Slovenia. Europe is also doing this as well. The EU has started this. They want to know the Polish brain drain when it comes to cancer research. Where are they? Where is the major? Where are they situated? A lot of the Polish with cancer experts are situated in the United States, 38% of them, followed by Great Britain and followed by Germany. And Slovenians, a lot of them are 
in Great Britain, followed by US, followed by Germany. You can easily do this if you have this big data platform to know who are the professors of immunology or who are the professors of anthropology or nuclear physicists. Where are they located? I want to know all the professors that are nuclear physicists or professor of law from Sudan. Wherever they are, where are they concentrated most? And then I can tell the foreign ministry or the foreign commission in that country to start engaging with them, to provide cogent legislation for a particular problem in our country. Diaspora scholars and Canadian, this is Morocco Canada, this is Morocco Delta. This was produced by even by the Canadian government. They want to know number of diaspora scholars in Canadian universities that are of Moroccan origin. So the blue ones are the lecturers, senior lecturers, readers, associate professors, and emeritus professors. They want to know. That's British University of British Columbia. That's McMaster University, University of Ottawa, University of Toronto, University of Montreal. These are Moroccan academics in Canadian universities. This is done by, this is Canada, Canadian Science Policy Conference. This is 2015, just last year. They produced this data. If the Western world can do this, what is our country doing? Boston demographics, this is US. They want to know Hispanic Latino in Boston area. This was developed by Boston uh, Development Authority. Black African in Boston, in the US. And Italian, right, that are based in Boston. How many of them? And they can even expand it more and say which sectors are they mostly concentrated. Another, another interesting one, which the IPO, the World Patent Office is doing, is analyzing patent data. Who has filed what type of patent? Imagine if Nigerian government knows who has filed what type of patent in Nigeria, then they can contact those people. And we're talking of startups. You go to Silicon Valley in California, it contributes about 50% of their GDP of the US, the startups. And most of them are considered in Silicon Valley. A lot of them ask God to do with patents. And if you go and ask, most of the people in this country, they're Africans and Asians, South Asians. Indians, Nigerians, Sudanese, these are the major Egyptians. A lot of the people in this country, particularly the English-speaking African countries, they are the majority of the owners of the startups in Silicon Valley. But America is exploiting it and they are making money from it. So demographics of innovation in the United States. This was done by the US themselves. Sorry. Another typical one, apart from all this, even ourselves, if there is a particular data platform, big, da big data business that analyzes infectious diseases spread, <clears throat> they're securing funding with it. This was done also in the United States to look at infectious diseases and what type of infectious diseases and how they are spreading. You can use your big data analytics to do that. So in conclusion, what am I talking about? Because of time, I can't go much into detail, but I will entertain a lot of questions if you, if you want to ask me. It's all about, let's combine big data, all the data, let's get the data of everybody. You know, we have challenges with it, we have privacy, but we can easily sort it out. If Google can sort it out, LinkedIn could sort out privacy data help. Facebook are sorting it out. We can do that. Right? If I, somebody cannot just get access to my data in Facebook unless I accept the person as a friend. Right? The same thing as a Twitter. We can sort all this bottleneck out. We need to start something. Whether the government is ready to support us or not, this is our opportunity. It is the golden age of digital revolution. And this is our time. Because if we do not do it now, our children will ask us, what have we done to contribute to the development of Africa and developing world? Thank you very much.